Today, I'm reacting to 20 minutes of insane WWE injuries, which is nostalgic for me since some of my earliest, most popular videos were on the same topic. It's no secret that professional wrestlers push their bodies to the limit for the sake of our ringside entertainment, and while they may not be trying to injure each other, mistakes or bumps do happen. And bumps and bruises like these are part of the game. Just ask McIntyre, who suffered a series of nasty looking contusions after a Hell in the Cell match versus Bobby Lashley. But thankfully for him, a contusion is a region of injured tissue or skin in which capillaries, the smallest type of blood vessels with thin leaky walls that help to change fluids and gases between the tissues and blood have been ruptured. And just like most WWE weapon matches, it looks worse than it is. Or worse than it sounds. Oh my God! Technically, contusions are a type of hematoma, which refers to any collection of blood outside of a blood vessel. Most bruises heal in approximately two weeks, fading away as the body breaks down and reabsorbs the blood. Here's something the body won't heal so easily. Baszler accidentally hit a bit too hard and one of Asuka's teeth went flying out of her mouth. But did you know a tooth that has been knocked out can be replaced in the socket successfully if you take the right action? Of course, this was a plan. Because of it, the Empress of Tomorrow had to take a short amount of time off to recover. Dentalhealth.org tells us, don't touch the root. If the tooth is very dirty, rinse it with milk or tap water. Do not clean it with disinfectant or let it dry out. Hold the tooth by the crown and put the tooth back into the socket firmly, root first. Bite down on a clean handkerchief for approximately 15 to 20 minutes and then get to the dentist ASAP. A dental office in Westminster explains, if the bone around the tooth was not fractured, the root usually will reattach firmly to the bone in about three to four weeks, while more damage to the area may require six to eight weeks of repair time. Though surely painful, better this than a chip or a crack. When compared to bones, which have plenty of blood vessels running through them, tooth enamel isn't supplied with fresh oxygen and nutrients. Only the root contains blood vessels and nerves. So once a tooth is damaged, it can't repair itself. So what about a broken nose? Of which there is no shortage among professional wrestlers. And now the double team by Ricochet and Cesaro. That hurt. Now the double team by Ricochet. A botched front flip by a couple inches and Ridge Holland looked like this post-match. We don't talk about my nose, 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 nose. Does it surprise you to learn that nasal bones are the most frequently fractured bones in the maxillofacial area due to their relative weakness and the outward projection of the nose on the face? And as such, this is a very common injury among professional wrestlers. Rare to get through this one. Oh, here's the thing, Corey. Oh! For the last couple weeks, Carrillo knows he can hit. Wait, 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 wait. Did you catch that? Help us out, Tap Out Corner. The Luchador punched the Celtic Warrior in the face, but accidentally hit Sheamus on the nose. Within seconds, Sheamus was bleeding. It only got worse as the match continued. Right. Since the inside of your nose is full of tiny, delicate blood vessels that easily sustain damage and bleed. Remember that blood supplies tissues with the nutrients and oxygen necessary for healing, and thus nasal fractures tend to heal fairly effectively. Many a nasal fracture can be treated via closed reduction and splinting, with packing on the internal passage of the nostril and a dressing on the outside. This procedure must be completed in a timely fashion, within about a week, to ensure the bones and cartilage don't settle in a misaligned position. Cartilage is a strong, flexible connective tissue that protects your joints and bone. And generally, once damaged, it does not regenerate, except cartilage cells from the nasal septum. The part of the nose that separates the nostrils are known to have a great capacity to grow and form new cartilage. You know what they say, if you need a new knee, look no further than the end of your nose.
Uh, okay, okay, we don't really say that. But Helen Thompson did write a 2014 article for New Scientist, an article that highlights the possibility of the knee to nose transplant. Two years later, the project lead researcher Ivan Martin, professor of tissue engineering at the University of Basel and University Hospital Basel in Switzerland, published a follow-up, our findings confirm the safety and feasibility of cartilage grafts engineered from nasal septum cells to repair damaged knee cartilage. Which reminds me. <laughs> Logan Paul's knee injury was a combined MCL and meniscal tear. The medial collateral ligament, or the MCL, is a ligament that provides valgus, or oblique displacement of a part of the limb away from the midline, stability to the knee. In many cases, we won't even operate on this because the ligament is part of the joint capsule, has a robust blood supply, and often fails in continuity, meaning that it is pulled off its origin on the femur or its insertion on the tibia allowing it to easily heal. Alternatively, perhaps the torn meniscus, a C-shaped piece of tough rubbery cartilage that acts as one of two shock absorbers between the shin bone and the thigh bone, could be fixed with a slice of Logan's own nose. But in all seriousness, though I have never performed this type of graft, this is a really cool development and I look forward to seeing how it plays out and for what conditions it can be applied. As for Logan, I covered his injury in full detail in another video, so I suggest you cue that up for later. Okay, interns, pop quiz. Does this look like a normal, healthy shoulder? In her SummerSlam match versus Bianca Belair, Becky Lynch suffered a shoulder dislocation after an awkward landing onto her right shoulder. The explosive ability of Bianca Belair on display. Oh, shoulder first. If we pause the clip at the moment of the impact, we can clearly see the mechanism of injury at play here. Although at first, Becky's arm is extended as if to brace her fall, it tucks under her body, leaving her shoulder to connect cleanly with the canvas. The angle of impact directly onto the side of her body with the arm and the shoulder extended in front of her in a combination of adduction and internal rotation leaves only one real option for her, an anterior dislocation, where the head of the arm bone or humerus is displaced forward in front of the socket, which also happens to be the most common type of shoulder dislocation. The presence of the ground behind her prevents a posterior dislocation where the head of the humerus moves behind the socket. We can also rule out a posterior dislocation, which have an incidence of about 1 in 200, or 0.5%, of all dislocations and are very easy to spot. After the match, Becky took to Twitter to reassure her fans and later on in August when The Rock asked her about her injury on Instagram Live. I feel like I've gotten a bunch more mobility in it because when it happened, it was so painful. I was like, oh no, I'm going to be out for a long, long time. The restoration of mobility is a great sign and can occur once the dislocated shoulder has been reduced or put back gently, sometimes forcefully, into place. <laughs> <laughs> Many shoulder dislocations can be treated non-operatively, but the patient may require sedation to get adequate muscle relaxation and facilitate said closed reduction via traction, counter-traction, and manipulation. Multiple ligaments are present in the shoulder, but the inferior glenohumeral ligament is the most important stabilizer against antero-inferior shoulder dislocation, and therefore the most frequently injured. Injuries range from a complete tear of the ligament capsule off one of its bony attachments to simple stretches and sprains of these structures. But now it's it, it's healing up real quick. I'm, I'm feeling strong, I'm feeling good, so I'm hoping it won't be much time at all. It is my guess that Becky's dislocation only strained the associated ligaments, as I can't find any record of her having undergone any surgical procedure, as would be required with a more severe tear. Unfortunately, our next patient wouldn't be so lucky. Wrestling fans around the world were shocked by Cody Rhodes' injury reveal at the beginning 
Yes, the beginning of his Hell in a Cell match versus Seth Rollins. Before I explain why he was allowed to wrestle with a complete tear to his right pectoral tendon, let's get ourselves acquainted with the injury. On the Raw before Cody's Hell in a Cell match with Seth Rollins, Rhodes and Rollins got into a brawl. During the fight, Cody tore his right pectoral tendon. Thanks, Tap Out Corner. So apparently, a partial tear occurred during a different fight between Rhodes and Rollins. During the event, Cody is wearing a shirt, covering any immediate contusions that may have occurred, and shows no obvious sign that he has suffered an injury. However, we know that traumatic injury of the pectoralis major most commonly occurs due to excessive tension on a maximally eccentrically contracted muscle, as explained by Edward J. Durant of the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine in NIH. He goes on to explain, this setup typically occurs during the downward portion of a bench press, with the arm in the final 30 degrees of humeral extension and external rotation, while pushing against heavy resistance. And although there was no bench press present during the initial tear, there are many moments in a wrestling match where this mechanism could occur. Clothesline anyone? That is the clothesline. So here are some moments that I found hiding in plain sight. Forceful punches where Cody cocks his arm back <laughs> emphatically. They'll settle the score this Sunday. Chaos. Struggling theatrically against people trying to hold him back with arms <laughs> cocked. These moments may not look like much, but Cody need only have a moderate injury to leave him susceptible for a full tear later on. Walked in the gym, flip flops on, open cup of coffee, a little bit of this real old timer warm up, got on the bench, put on 295. And since we've already established that pectoralis major tendon tears are most commonly associated with bench press, I'm sure you can tell where I'm going with this. <laughs> Was going for four. The dude at the other side of the gym, you know, the testosterone filled. Do you have a spotter? No, now I'm going to show him. I just <laughs> unrack it, just unrack it, and it went right away. Well, interns, let this be a reminder of the importance of proper warm ups in the gym, lest you end up like Cody. A little bit of this real old timer warm up. This also speaks somewhat to the fact that tendons and ligaments, whose primary constituent is collagen, take a substantially longer time to respond and adapt to resistance forces than do muscle or bone. It went like Velcro. They're like, did it pop? It doesn't pop. It went shh, shh, and I felt it. Full tear. Full tear. Yep. I didn't need to kick the weights off. They flew off. Yep. The Velcro shh, shh, moment that Cody is talking about is what we call a full avulsion, where a tendon literally tears off the bone. Dr. Durant's article from earlier sheds further light on this moment, stating, the most common types of injuries of the pectoralis major muscle are tendon avulsions at the site of insertion by this mechanism. 50 would be lucky. And if we look at the extensive bruising that is occurring on Cody's chest, we can see that the bruising surrounds the pectoralis major connection point, more specifically above the anterior deltoid tendon insertion on the humerus, where the pectoralis major tendon inserts into a visible and palpable bony ridge along the lateral lip of the bicipital groove, which is an indentation on the anterior aspect of the proximal part of the humerus, or upper arm. Less commonly, a myotendinous junction tear, located at the interface between muscle and tendon, where force is transmitted between the two tissues, might occur, due to direct trauma. A complete avulsion like Cody's must be repaired surgically. The torn muscle tendon is dissected out and pulled back to where it should be, since when detached from the bone, the tendon, like a firm elastic, <laughs> retracts with every contraction of the associated muscle fibers. In Cody's case, because I had cramped up the attachment that's on my collarbone that my pec was still attached to. Still, a tendon can't be torn twice, unless Cody was allowed to wrestle through the pain. Oh my gosh, I can't believe they're letting him do this. But the retraction of the tendon and muscle may have been exacerbated to some degree by this decision. I hit a springboard cutter and I thought I was about to vomit. After all, Pain is the body's signal that something is amiss. As soon as possible after the match, the tendon would have been repaired using either sutures along or sutures attached to anchors, the latter of which can be inserted into bone to secure the tendon there. With proper rest and rehab, 
A torn pec can heal within three to four months, although full functional ability might take a few months longer. Thankfully, Cody has since returned to the ring. And now with Jey Uso on his shoulders, Boogs looking right at Jey's brother Jimmy, and Jimmy's caught his hole. Oh, 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 they got him down too much. At over 250 pounds, Rick Boogs is a powerful presence in the ring. But here, under the weight of the Uso brothers, his leg gives out. Boogs too much. gave out the superhuman's knee. You saw Boogs immediately grab the knee. Turns out that Rick injured his patellar tendon very severely. My patellar tendon ripped off the bone. It ripped off the bone on one side, it ripped off the bone on the other side, and it ripped all the way through. Well, that's not good. So the patellar tendon connects the bottom of the kneecap, or patella, to the top of the shin bone, or tibia, and works with the muscles in front of the thigh to straighten the leg. A complete tear to the patellar tendon is a disabling injury. Think unable to walk without falling down. I keep on falling. Side note. Typically, structures that connect bone to bone are known as ligaments, and as such, the patellar tendon is sometimes called the patellar ligament. It is the adjacent patella that attaches the quadriceps muscle to the quadriceps tendon. My kneecap was high on my leg. That's when I knew something was wrong. When they were bending my knee, it was like the most excruciating feeling ever. Yeah, it'll do that to you. Tendons are tensile structures that may retract, as I mentioned earlier when detached from the bone. This holds true in the case of a detached patellar tendon ligament because the patella is a floating bone and it isn't attached to another bone. Thus, as the thigh muscles contract, the patella and patellar tendon, now dangling below it, shift upwards. Three full 100% tears of the tendon. So when we say six months, that means six months for you to get back to you. Interestingly enough, a patellar tendon rupture is typically the result of tensile overload on the extensor mechanism in individuals with long-standing chronic tendon degeneration, occurring when the quadriceps muscle suddenly contracts with the knee in a flexed position. But obviously, the combined weight of the two Uso brothers and Rick's own body weight were enough to cause tensile overload of the extensor mechanism while the leg is fully extended. My guess is it happens right here. There is a split second where Rick shuffles his feet, lifting his left leg and transferring all the weight he is carrying onto his right. Simultaneously, he is attempting to straighten his legs or complete the squat to stand tall, but with the Uso brothers' weight distributed unevenly over his right shoulder, there is extreme force distributed to the right patellar tendon. I mean, you can't foresee injuries like this. Uh, six months to get back to kind of you. Yeah. Six months to get back to you. Okay. But that's the priority. Okay. So just, you'll get there. Dr. Douglas is correct. Once the surgery is completed, generally using suture anchors attached to the patella, if a proximal rupture, to the tibial tuberosity, if a distal rupture, or by way of bone tunnels through the patella, if arthroscopic anchors are not available, Rick will begin the rehabilitation process, which will include measured reestablishment of a full range of motion of the knee with stretching exercises, before a restoration of functional strength with resistance strength training, and a restoration of normal gait mechanics with proprioception and balance training. I'm bigger, I'm better, I'm stronger. I'm feeling very, very good about coming back. I hope you'll join me in wishing Rick well in his future matches. And although I'm sure his rehabilitation was challenging, I'd much rather sustain an injury to the knee than I would to my neck. Oh, Moss, this, middle of the be good. Good. Alabama oh, strong, oh, right on the this. top of Moss's head. Madcap Moss spikes. The cervical spine does not fare well under such compressive force, but sometimes looks are deceiving. The most shocking part is that Madcap Moss walked it off and continued the match like the whole thing didn't happen. Madcap Moss had Lady Luck on his side. To be honest, when I first saw that impact in Tapout's injury compilation, I thought for sure he was headed down the same road as Big E, who unfortunately suffered a broken neck in a botched Ridge Holland slam. Set up, Big E knew what was coming. And now Ridge with a throw, his own drop, and Big E. I covered this injury in another video where we talk in detail about injuries to the cervical spine. Join me there to continue your medutainment journey.
Or if you need to get up and move, check out my online gym, Human 2.0 Fitness for free here on YouTube, where we help you move better and prevent injury. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. If you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.